Welcome everyone to another one of our webinars. Very happy to have you. Uh, Tony and myself have been creating these webinars basically with the main purpose of giving free practical, practical resources for your deliberate practice. So whether you're a student or a practicing clinician or a supervisor or teacher, we're trying to create deliberate practice resources freely available so that you can use them in your own context. So today we're really excited to talk about how to use your videos or your videotaped recorded sessions. Last week, some of you joined us. Uh, we had a very fun webinar that's uh, free available to recording online on just encouraging safe videotaping, video recording. Um, we have gone through it and we have lived to tell the tale in most cases. So now we're gonna take a step further. Now that you have actually recorded maybe one or two videos, what would you actually do with them for Dolor Practice? So all the resources we're gonna talk about today will be freely available on our website, and that's dp4therapists.com. The slides, you probably got these slides I'm sharing today. I actually did a very slight tweak to the slides, so you can see the last version of the slides on our website. This. Uh, Webinar will also be video recorded and will be posted there. So now that that's out of the way, we can get to the good stuff. So last week we were touching on how in deliberate practice research and when applying deliberate practice, one core principle of effective training is observing performance. Meaning we try as much as possible to not go with self-reported performance, which in our case would be clinicians talking about what happened in session through their memory, right? And trying to move into more observing of actual performance, which will give us a, a much better sense of what actually is going on, what are our current limitations and how we can help ourselves, our trainees, etc. So observing performance is a core principle, as you can see here. Just a very quick reminder, refresher, that we try as much as possible in the practice to base our expert feedback, for example, as supervisors, on that observed performance. And that will probably predict a lot better training outcomes. And from that, we try to create small learning goals, create actual experientially rehearsable behavioral tasks that we can try out. And we'll be assessing the performance of the therapist along the way to see if they actually get more effective with time. So you might be wondering, Maybe you're already convinced and you want to videotape maybe some sessions, maybe you want to do some little practice, where should you start? One suggestion for picking a focus, and what I mean by picking a focus is even who should you record, right? Usually when we're coaching people and giving little practice supervision, there are maybe two main criteria we can follow. One is if you're tracking your outcomes in a more formal way with measurement, we would suggest that you focus on those clients that are struggling the most. These would be clients with low outcome scores that are maybe stalling or deteriorating, but in some sense, the client is telling you that they are struggling and they do need that extra care outside of the consulting room, right? So that would be one criteria for whom to film. Now, let's imagine that you do not track outcomes, totally fine. Right. Another way is, of course, a bit more subjective. If uh, you just want to have some video recordings of some clients that would probably would be helpful to have those video recordings, you want to try to focus on clients and interactions that you are most struggling with. Now, of course, this is much more subjective. To try to make it a bit more concrete, we've devised a simple thought experiment that I call the calendar thought experiment. And you can try it now in real time. Ask yourselves who are the clients that evoke the most complex feelings when you're looking at your clinical schedule. So, and this is again, not at all shaming clients. This is for our own benefit, right? So if you go through the, that list of clients you're gonna see during your week, there's probably gonna be one or two that you're like, okay, this Tuesday I have that person, I gotta gear up, right? That's also a good marker to focus on those clients. So this would be two simple criteria to try to gauge who should you suggest video recording therapy. And if you want more information on that, you can check out our last webinar, which uh, as I said, is recorded because that's all about training actually the implementation of video recording. Okay, so let's imagine that you video recorded a client. 
maybe you had a client with you know deteriorating through an outcome measure or maybe you're just struggling subjectively personally with a specific client or maybe you're starting out and you just want to try this, try this you know you don't have to have outcome measures you don't even have to be particularly freaking out over a client you can just pick something right and now let's imagine you have a videotape now what how would you do the little practice with that tape now here's again my photo with my therapeutic poker face and i'm trying to be very empathic one problem with videotapes that you're soon gonna pick up on is that there's an absurd amount of information going on meaning if you go into a videotape by yourself without a supervisor or coach and just start looking at the tape with no uh, prior kind of idea of what you're going to be looking for, chances are you're going to feel pretty overwhelmed pretty quick, quickly. Because there's all these therapist variables, all these client variables, all these interventions you're trying, all these complex feelings on both sides. So if you just say, I'm going to watch this tape and do the little practice and have no idea what you're going to do and you're by yourself, I would not suggest that this would be the most effective way to maximize actual behavior rehearsal, meaning to maximize time to actually practice something, right? So this leads us to an important distinction, which I would call the two types of deliberate practice exercises. So we've been developing, and you can develop your own, that's the fun part of it, what we can call generic skill building exercises. Now, generic skill building exercises are those exercises that are universally important skills to practice. And honestly, kind of independently of what client you're seeing or what stage of professional development you're at, you're probably going to go back to these variables sometime or the other. So, for example, in a basketball player, they never stop practicing dribbling right? There's never a time where they say, okay, I'm done with practicing dribbling. I'm good enough at dribbling. Never again will I practice dribbling, right? It just doesn't happen in practice. So there are some skills that are, we can say, generic or universal. You're constantly going back to them. Those skills have some advantages to them. First of all, since they're kind of a one size fits all, for example, the dribbling, every basketball player, whatever stage they're at, will do the dribbling practice. That means that they can be applied in a group setting. You don't have to personalize the exercise to that specific trainee. And it's much easier to implement without having a coach. So you by yourself can actually try it out. You know what you're supposed to be doing and you just try it out. Now there are more specific personalized little practice exercises that are completely focused on you as an individual professional. And these are more dependent on having an ongoing one-on-one -on -one coaching. So for example, if you have a very nuanced need with a very specific client or a very specific psychological muscle you wanna build, probably it's gonna be so nuanced that having a more universal skill building exercise won't cut it. And you're gonna need outside help to really gauge what do you need for this specific case. Now it's interesting because what we find in the expertise literature is that the further you go in your own professional development towards expertise, the more probable it is that your need for personalized DP will increase over time. In other words, when you're starting out, you can basically get by with just practicing generic skill building exercises and you can do that for the whole year. When you get to more nuanced layers of complexity, you've nailed down these generic skill building exercises, you can do it by yourself without the need of an external coach, then uh, you need more personalized uh, ongoing coaching, right? Now this puts the question that of course, it's wonderful to have personalized coaching. The problem is of course, resources, time, money, all of this is a factor when having a one-on-one -on -one coaching. So Tony and I have been working on this very ambitious, some might say crazy project of doing a bunch of books for APA, uh, one for each major model of therapy and major approaches. And these are books that we could call generic skill building books. Meaning, of course, the book doesn't know you specifically and your needs. So a book can't give you personalized neural practice, but it can give you generic exercises from different approaches that you can try out and practice and get better over time, right? 
So in, for example, in an emotion focused therapy uh, lower practice book, you have specific instructions and criteria to try out different empathic interventions, for example, and you can do that. I would not say that generic skill building exercises are just for kids, meaning are just for those starting. This applies to everyone. What will probably happen is that the more expert you get, you're going to be doing the two of them, the generic and the personalized. Now, okay, let's get back to the task at hand. So you have a videotape, right? You chose a client you want to videotape, you suggested the client hopefully uh, agreed. So now you have a videotape of this client. You might ask yourself, what should I practice with this video? Because like we said before, there's too much information in any single video. So it's better to come in at least with some idea of what you're gonna be wanting to do, right? And again, we're saying this in the case that you don't have a coach, right? Because if you have a coach, you're gonna get that personalized aspect. You don't have to come with a small learning goal from the beginning. Now we, we give out some suggestions for practicing um, and these are based on basically the psychotherapy outcome research literature. So this is a fantastic book that's been, you know, constantly updated by John Norcross. John Norcross. Uh, the third edition came out, I believe, last year. And these are common, we can call common therapeutic factors that are very uh, heavily investigated and are strongly correlated with clinical outcomes. So what that means is you focusing on these skills will probably be a safe bet in terms of them impacting your outcomes as a therapist over time. And you can see these are some things that most of us are already familiar with, like practicing for therapeutic alliance, repairing alliance ruptures, empathy, collecting client feedback. All of these things, we can make specific deliver practice exercises out of them and practice. So again, if you just have a videotape, you're just starting out in the lower practice, you don't have a coach, we would suggest that you might want to consider focusing on these skills. Now, this doesn't mean that you might not focus on more specific kind of skills from a specific model you're interested in investing in, right? So these are just some generic uh, suggestions. You might want to focus on, let's say, a CPT therapist. How could I practice cognitive restructuring? Totally fine, right? In ISTDP, how could you do better, more eloquent type of defense work? Totally fine. This, I think, is a good bet for basically everyone today watching us. So this is the only slide that you don't have in the, those initial slides that I sent you, but you'll be able to download uh, this on our website. So I just realized as we're coming in that it's better to have the generic instructions for what to do with your video. So again, let's imagine you picked up a client, you have a video tip of this client, I would suggest that you select and watch 30 seconds to one minute of that video. Now, if you have a specific section you know is particularly str struggling, it's particularly difficult, you might want to go there. But we found that actually you can go a lot of the times kind of almost at random because you'll probably find interesting opportunities for practice in whatever stage of the clinical tape. So it's not super important where you're at. I wouldn't be too concerned about where you're at at the tape unless you're practicing something very specific. So select and watch 30 seconds to one minute of that video and pause the video tape. Then improvise a response based on the exercise skill criteria that you chose to focus on. And we're gonna get to that in a minute. Remember that to actually be considered a little practice, it has to be experiential, a bodily movement kind of thing. So you actually have to say your intervention out loud to the video. Don't just think about it or write it down. Because the problem with thinking about it is that it's gonna sound a lot more eloquent in your head than when it comes out of your mouth. And I'm speaking from a lot of experience. I think that I have the beautiful intervention and when it comes out of my mouth, it, it's more like a Picasso. It has its beauty, right? But only from an angle, right? So practice improvising response based on the exercise you're practicing and use the deliberate practice reaction form that you, we've been using in different contexts and we're gonna try it out today as well for difficulty assessments and adjustments. And finally, repeat this exercise for five to 10 minutes. This is the part that uh, most people will struggle with, meaning the repetition aspect. 
Now, unfortunately, uh, and Tony, you might want to reinforce this bit, without repeating, unfortunately, it's very hard to get gains out of the lower practice. Meaning if you just try it once, you're really not getting it into your bones, right? It's like practicing a scale. Doing the scale once really doesn't equate to practicing the scale. Go ahead, Tony. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah, because in traditional supervision, often people will try out, you know, saying something once or twice, like the supervisor will demonstrate and trade. And, and that's great. Uh, but we've found that it's not sufficient for a few reasons. Um, first of all, uh, the goal here is to try to move these skills into procedural memory rather than declarative memory. So it's almost like, so your muscles just kind of know how to do it, which will then let you kind of free up some brain processing uh, power to be thinking about like conceptualization or assessment or all the other things we have to be thinking about during a session, right? We're really expected to multitask. So, so that's one. Another reason is one of the benefits of deliberate practice, because the client is not in front of you, you can try and experiment with different ways of saying something. You know, there are, there are literally infinite ways of expressing empathy, right? And in deliberate practice, if you try for five or 10 minutes, you could try 20 or 30 or 50 different ways. And you can really get a sense of what feels right for you, what feels totally wrong for you, you know, that kind of thing. So these are uh, these are the benefits. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, and uh, I might add that this is again the part that you might struggle with the most because this is the part everyone struggles with the most, the repeating part. It's also the part where hopefully we'll learn the most about ourselves and our own skill threshold. So there's this kind of double edge aspect to it because it might promote some shame and self, some self criticism, but when done right, it's probably the thing that's going to help you the most. And this is the most deliberate practice part of the deliberate practice, let's say. So, okay, so you have a videotape, you want to watch an excerpt. We want to choose an exercise, a generic skill building exercise to try it out with this uh, client that you're having trouble with. Uh, and you want to repeat a practice. So I can't, of course, show you a videotape of my own client. So we're going to pretend that I'm bringing you a videotape of a client of mine today. Okay, just to experiment. Uh, what we're going to do, and I would invite you to join in with me, I'm going to do an exercise now. Feel free to join me. And you can keep imagining as we're doing this, what, what would it be like to do this, but for your own videotapes, right? Because we're going to use a standardized video client, and that's very different, of course, than using a video of your own clients. So we found that actually... A lot of people try out these exercises with standardized clients and might find it challenging or even easy to do. But when they do the same exercise with their own clients, they find it sometimes overwhelming or too hard, right? So we're gonna try it out in the safe space now of a standardized video. And we're gonna do a basic generic skill building exercise just to give you a taste of what we're talking about. This is empathic understanding. It was one of those variables that we saw before uh, from this list. So empathy is highly correlated uh, with outcomes, meaning the client's sense of feeling understood, right? And we can train therapists to give better empathic interventions. There's a lot of research about micro skills, uh, uh, counseling, training. So empathy is uh, generally a good place to go if you don't know where to go, therapeutic alliance as well. And usually when you're str struggling with a client, usually empathy is a, a good thing to practice with those clients as well. So we're gonna try out with the video, again, pretending that this is your videotape. We're gonna try to not interpret or question the client's experience. We're not gonna provide advice or a diverging opinion. We're gonna try to capture and reflect back the core meaning or feeling behind the client's statements. And we're gonna use tentative exploratory tone, okay? So capture and reflect back the core meaning of feeling behind the client's statement. So I'm gonna show us a video now. At the end of the video, the video will be paused and whoever wants to actually try this out with me, I'm gonna mute myself and I'm actually gonna talk back to the screen, trying out an intervention based on those skill criteria. So let's go. I'm not even sure why I came in to see you today. I don't think there's 
any point in trying to feel better anymore. I have felt so bad for such a long time now. I'm just so tired. Okay, now practice intervening. Okay, so now I'd invite you, whoever wants to try it out, if you could on the chat put a rating from 0 to 10, how full do you think that felt, how hard did you think it felt to do this empathic understanding with this client? Thanks so much for thanks so much for everyone for chiming in. So so far I'm noticing a trend, and Tony, I don't know if you also want to comment on a lot of people saying about a six, and that would tell us that it's kind of on a challenging but not overwhelming zone, which is actually where we want to be in the world of practice people who scored a little bit higher, great. It just means that we probably need to tailor the exercise. Again, the reason why we do this is not an academic paperwork reason. It's to actually pragmatically tailor the exercise so it can be more helpful to you. So just to remind you what we talked about last time, if you're feeling that this is a challenging thing to do with this client, I would say, wonderful, let's do it again. Right? When you're in that good area, the zone of proximal development, you want to do the exact same exercise, right? If it's too easy, you want to tailor it. If it's too hard, you want to tailor it. And we have some criteria for that. I'm not going to go too much into that right now. Okay. So great work. Thanks, everyone, for chiming in. I'm sorry that I wasn't muted that last time. Let's add a layer of complexity. So we were focusing on these interpersonal criteria, right? Now we're gonna bring in an intrapersonal criteria to the mix. So we're gonna do the same exercise, same video, but the video is a, it's a version of the video that's a little bit longer. So maybe a bit more challenging, we'll see. And you have the extra criteria now of treating your own inner experience throughout. So as you're trying out intervention, see, what bodily reactions, emotions, thoughts come up for you, right? So now we're practicing a dual focus, the inter and the intra, okay? Okay, let's try it with the video. I'm not even sure why I came in to see you today. I don't think there's any point in trying to feel better anymore. I have felt so bad for such a long time now. I'm just so tired. I'm thinking more and more about suicide. One of these days, I saw a film about a, a guy who killed himself and I, and I felt jealous of him. I 
on my way here today, I actually thought about walking out in front of a car and, and what a relief it would be if I were dead. Cry intervention. If whoever would be so kind to share again. Alex? Yeah. Can we ask people to share, if they feel comfortable, two numbers? The first number is how difficult it felt responding verbally to the client. And second, how internally challenging it felt, emotionally challenging. So I'll, right. I'll give an example. For me, it's like eight responding yeah. verbally and seven internal discomfort. Great. Chiming as well. So this is where the, the differences come in. Mine was the other way around. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just like to highlight that, how we're seeing a good variety in, how, in difficulty assessments which is what we aim for is, you know, some videos are more provocative for more difficult for some people and more for others. There's no right answer. Uh, it, you know, as long as it's a nine or a 10, you could argue means like it's too hard. So we want to scale it back and a one to a four might be a little too easy, but otherwise there's, it, it, you know, there's no wrong answer. There's, you're just trying to kind of flush out what works for you. And, and, and this is to be very frank, I think the, the, the great thing about the little practice is that most of us have felt this or of course still feel this a lot of the times, but when we start practicing, I mean, I speak for myself, I was probably in an eight, nine or 10 in whatever session I was in, right? Because we're just thrown into these very evocative uh, places with no emotional muscle built in, right? So in the little practice, you actually have the, the opportunity, the luxury of practicing some of these things in a safer space, right? specifically with videos of your clients, this becomes even more transformative, right? Because it's kind of, you're establishing an attachment even outside of the therapy room. You're actually continuing the relationship in a, what, in a weird way. And you're giving yourself the opportunity to, to digest a lot of complex feelings, a lot of skill deficits in a much safer place. So this is what you're seeing here is the full, full, thank you everyone for sharing your ratings, by the way. And we're seeing for a lot of people, this is quite evocative and for myself as well. So we're attuned <laughs> for a lot of people. What this would mean is that maybe help from a coach could be good. Um, and to just tailor it. I I'm with you, Heidi. Yes. A, a lot of supervision focuses on one or the other sometimes and having actual experiential exercise to focus on both can be very helpful. Um, this is the full version of the Delivery Practice Reaction Form, which is available at our website. Now, we want to give you just one last free resource, which is the Therapist Diary Form. So we just went through the DP Reaction Form, which you can use for your practice. And this is, you can say, a, a travel log for your Delivery Practice journey. For example, if you're starting out in the practice by yourself or with a coach, you can use this for whatever session of practice you do to log what you did, what was helpful, what wasn't so helpful, what did you learn about yourself, which for me is my favorite question. So while doing practice and after it, what did I learn about myself while doing it? This is a fillable PDF that you can download at our website, meaning you can write on the PDF itself and you can store it for your own purposes. And 
I found that when supervising uh, people and coaching people, it actually is a really huge help for both the supervisee and for myself because it kind of keeps track of our journey. What we've been focusing on, how has it been working out? What do we need to tailor? What do we need to do different or more of the same? It's just a nice, simple thing that takes two minutes to write and really organizes the little practice work. So these are two free tools. You know, you can download free of charge at our website. Again, that's dp4therapist.com. The way you go about it is you go to the website and the resources, you have a tab here called DP Forms and Materials. And you'll see here the DP Reaction Form, which we're doing to assess difficulty, and this DP Therapist Diary Form, which we would suggest that you fill out after a full session of practice. Also, you might be wondering about the skill criterion exercises. So we did one exercise. What about more? We've developed simple suggestions of instructions for DP exercises, and we've compiled them for you. These are, again, free of charge. So you can go to the website. Under the Resources tab, there's Instructions for DP Exercises. And you'll see a bunch of these therapeutic, you can call them common factors kind of skills. That it's, it's our therapeutic dribbling, meaning probably useful to practice ongoing throughout one's career. And you'll see here empathic understanding, and it has the instructions and criteria if you want to try that with, with your videos. Goal setting, providing treatment rationale, preparing line structures. So you can explore these, but of course you can change these up in whatever way feels helpful to you. You can use these scripts, but tailored to any other skill that you want to practice. Go nuts. <laughs> Now, just one last thing that I want to mention is when does it help to get a coach, right? So you can try out with your own videos and I think you can do a lot of amazing little practice work by yourself. And actually in Ericsson's classic expertise studies, the most important part was how much time the trainee spent in solitary little practice. So the amount of time you do outside by yourself is the biggest predictor of expertise. But there's a caveat there. It's solitary practice, usually informed previously by a coach or a teacher. So it's different if you just are trying by yourself constantly the solitary practice, then going to the piano lesson, like I did very young, and I was coached about what I had to do, and then I went back home and did it a thousand times, right? So I was doing solitary practice, and the more I did it, the better, but it was informed by that coaching experience. So we would recommend that you might want to consider doing the little practice with a supervisor or coach to get that more nuanced and tailored goals and exercises. So when the generic maybe is not enough for you, when your solitary practice is feeling kind of unfocused or unmotivating, when it feels too hard or too easy consistently, so you're having some trouble by yourself tailoring the difficulty of the exercise, when it's not just feeling helpful or productive and there might be many roadblocks to that, so a, coach, a coach's function is to help you feel more productive in your practice, or when you want someone's help to ongoing monitoring of your progress. So a lot of coaches, what they do is they kind of stick to a plan with you to see how you're developing over time and just tailoring practice along the way. Now, if you're interested, um, we do have people who have extensive experience in researching and consulting in these issues. So on our website, again, you can go find a DP coach and you have our contacts here. We're training a new batch of coaches as we're speaking. So more people will be able to provide these services. But again, you have my email, you have Tony's email. If you have some question about practice itself, feel free to write us. We'd be very happy to send you more resources. And just as a last note, before we finish off with these slides, uh, just to remind you that we did develop this certification program based on our ongoing experience, doing the APA books, doing the research. And so on January 1st, 2021, we will start providing these three levels of certification and you can find more information about that on the website. So that was all. I hope that wasn't too much and hopefully giving you some ideas of what you might do with your own videos. And now we still have some time for Q&A. So maybe we'd love to open it up for everyone. Yeah, something I would emphasize, Alex, uh, while people are 
uh, considering questions is um, watching your own videos, doing your own deliberate practice so solo uh, has one big, big limitation, which is uh, you will still not be able to see your own blind spots. So aspects of your work that you are problems in your work that you are not aware of, like you just will still not be aware. It's not magic awareness. Uh, so it can really help uh, to have a coach even just periodically to specifically to look for uh, thing, blind spots that you might just be totally unaware of. So this is an opportunity for any questions you might have, either specific questions about what we talked today or any other questions concerning the world practice. Feel very free to, to write us. I, to... I, I would also be curious uh, if, if anyone here has experienced watching videos, using videos mm -hmm. of their own work, even in supervision, uh, if, if you could write it in the chat. I'm curious how many people here Oh, and Fabio here, a uh, great question about uh, getting consent from clients. So it's really important to get, at least in the United States, I, I'm not aware of other countries, United States, it's really important to get written consent from clients. And we talked about that a bunch in our last webinar, which is now a record, a, a recording of the webinars on our website. So I'd recommend going to our website and watching that webinar. Uh, we in the webinar we linked to a psychologist who's also a lawyer. Uh, his name is Arthur Zur, and he's at the ZurInstitute.com, and you can download consent forms there. I agree, Katie. Watching videos is daunting. <laughs> uh, wow, Heidi did a whole day watching videos in front of a cohort of other trainees. Yeah, it, that's and pretty survived. intense. <laughs> Yeah. Great. So there's a bunch of people, right? Jupe says uh, every few, every two weeks. Excellent. Um, so uh, Heidi asked a great question. Recommendations when training in a telehealth context. You know, this is interesting and we're all uh, learning this together now. Um, so, you know, because basically all of us are doing this, at least individually, if not, uh, you know, at, at a training clinic. Um, the advantage of using telehealth is most of the telehealth programs like Zoom have very easy ways to record video, uh, which can then be used in supervision. So it, it got a lot. You don't have to like have all these extra cameras and, you know, transfer the files and all that. So that's the advantage. The, the disadvantage or challenge is it's got to be done in a way that, uh, well, first of all, includes client consent, but is also secure, right? So I would strongly recommend against a recording video to a cloud provider unless it's a cloud provider that is specifically built to securely store uh, client videos, which do exist. Um, and, and those are great programs. I'm... I'm not going to recommend any here because they tend to change every few months and people could be watching this webinar in a year and, you know, who knows what's going to be current. Um, but you can reach out to your colleagues and, and find out. Uh, so, so yeah, in short, I would use a program that's specifically designed for that purpose. Um, but I know there's a number of training programs that use uh, telehealth programs to record the video and then the, the supervisor or coach can watch it even remotely from the trainee, and then they could use it in deliver practice. And uh, Neha said, uh, yeah, she said there's a lot of stuff happening on the video which you'd never uh, notice without supervision. Um, I still, when I watch videos of myself, I will frequently just be quite surprised by what I see. Um, uh, so, you know, it's just a human being, no matter how much we try, our memory is full of holes. We're not really genetically built to remember everything perfectly. Um, so a lot of you might also have the experience of feeling quite self-critical or, or shameful as you're doing it for myself with a lot of the videotapes of my most complex struggling clients. I have to start by practicing self-compassion work. 
Yeah. Because uh, I have spikes of anxiety and shame coming in watching those videos. So I'll have to start off by the intra personal aspect. I'm actually planning to do some compassion focused deliberate practice with a colleague in the coming months. So hopefully that's going to be something we'll focus on soon. Oh, wow. Wonderful. So many. So many. Yeah. Bonnie said something really interesting here where she records supervision to listen and practice what and what she did in supervision. And I, I did that actually years ago when I was doing supervision with uh, John Fredrickson and Alan Abbas. Um, I found that they, they would, they would say so many valuable things during the supervision. And I just like, couldn't, you know, even though I was taking notes, I didn't want to take too many notes because I wanted to stay connected to them. And I just couldn't like, you know, it was, it was, it was too much for me to absorb. So I recorded video of the supervisions and then later I would go through the supervision and be like, okay, I want to identify three skills that I think are just beyond my ability and then rehearse those skills. And sometimes I'd have multiple hours of deliver practice from each hour of supervision. So I'm just reading for the comments. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Heidi said, thank you for sharing that you feel shame and anxiety. Yes. So I will second that. In fact, I, I would say, I bet that is the most common response from both trainees and very experienced therapists when they start watching their own videos is mo nine out of 10, I, I would guess, feel some degree of shame and anxiety. Yeah. And it's really important that we normalize that and... That's something we can, like Alex said, practice self-compassion while watching our videos. It's something that says, and we're, we're gonna go through all these comments, but just to mention it's something that Tony and I realized after a while from just doing it ourselves and coaching a bunch of people, that it was the one topic constantly coming up and the need to work on compassion and self-compassion was just everywhere, basically. And it's an interesting parallel process because we're very often helping our clients with shame and anxiety. And so you could argue by kind of helping ourselves with, by going through rehearsing self-compassion ourselves in the context of the client video, we're kind of preparing to better help the client with those topics. Uh, Fabio had a question about uh, using a uh, video recording of actors. We found actors, uh, I mean, a bunch of different ways. Sometimes Alex knew a few and we, we found some through, I think it was Craigslist or, or what have you. And typically you can have a contract with an actor and just make sure to let them know what you're going to be using the videos for. And if you're going to be posting them to YouTube, you just want to be very explicit. So they're not surprised by any of that uh, later on. Actually, we found actors are very open to that. Yeah, and I have a lot of fun with that, Fabio. Like you can actually, if, if you yourself are struggling with a specific kind of clinical interaction or you want to practice something specific, yeah, feed them lines about what you want to work on. So Carol Fallender just had an excellent uh, comment that I really want to highlight. If you're recording supervision, you got to have multiple layers of consent. So consent from the supervisor, right? The trainee. But then if the client's video appears, if there's any identifying information about the client, you also want consent from the client about that. So my consent form for videotaping the client includes a description of how I use it in supervision and that I might be you know, recording the supervision and I might be doing delivered practice with it. And then there's a separate consent if I want to be able to use those videos in my own teaching. Um, and so there's multiple layers of that. Uh, Carol has some excellent um, courses on supervision, which goes into depth a lot. I, I think you can download those courses uh, on kind of pay-per-view or some, you know, it, so to speak, meaning you can take the courses online on demand. Carol, is that true? If you want to put in the website where people can access your courses, I remember taking your course at for the first time 15 years ago, I've taken it multiple times. So I, I really recommend uh, Carol's resources. Um, yeah. Yeah, Neha, we will be in touch about more compassion focus work. It's one of my main interests as well. And um, yeah, if you're noticing that you're going into a lot of self attack with watching your videos, I would suggest to not focus on the client, at least for the, at the beginning, but focus more on just yourself. And you can even not just, 
pause the video, don't even start the video, just stay with the video, see what feelings are coming up for you. And if it's challenging to stay with them, but not overwhelming, give yourself the space to really get in touch with those emerging experiences without forcing yourself into doing anything, into trying an intervention. Because as you know, like in any experiential work that you do, just sitting there with your experience might be already overwhelming enough. So doing it step by step can be super important. Yeah, I've worked with, uh, I've coached experienced therapists with three decades of experience who, I mean, shoot, almost would have a panic attack just even before we start the video. The shame could be so strong. And so it's just really important that we are patient with ourselves and practice self-compassion. So Fabio had the idea to to say this out loud because the uh, the chat doesn't appear in the webinar recording, but you can access Carol Fallender's um, uh, supervision, continuing education courses through PsychSem and also continuingEd.net or just Google Carol Fallender and uh, you'll find her courses. They're, they're highly recommended. There's also uh, the uh, uh, Chicago uh, International Conference on Clinical Supervision tom- that starts tomorrow that's online um, where uh, a bunch of us are going to be presenting uh, as well. So. Great. Should we start wrapping it up, Alex? I think so. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. This has always been a blast doing these webinars. You do have our emails. You have my email that I sent the registration link. On the website, you have Tony's email. Feel very free to send us emails if you need extra resources. Remember, the purpose of this website is to provide those practical resources. So if you need that extra help, let us know. And yeah, safe practice. Thanks, everyone. We'll be in touch over a future webinar. Uh, We'll let you know when that's going to be and what topic we'll be on. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and all the great questions. It was really good.